Father, I pray that your word will be proclaimed in faithfulness and truth now as I preach. Lord, I pray that you will allow me to sink into the background completely and that Christ will be exalted in the words uh, that I say today. Open our eyes to see great wonders in your word as we reflect upon the significance of the Lord's Supper. Stir the affections of our hearts so that we can think on these things in a way that worships you. There's lots of things, Lord, that we can think about in our minds, Lord. But Lord, it's my prayer that you will unite our minds and our hearts together so that the thoughts that we're having from your word are thoughts that are leading us in worship of you. This time is yours. This is, this is your holy word without any error in it. So Lord, help us to believe it like that, to cherish it and to treasure you in it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22 will be our starting point this morning. Luke 22 starting in verse 14. I have a lot of childhood memories regarding the Lord's Supper. When I was a child, I would often walk into the sanctuary and if I saw the table set up in the front of the room with its fancy gold dishes sitting on it. Many times there was actual cloth covering it. When I walked in and I would see that, one of the first thoughts that would come into my mind as a child was, great, the preacher's not going to preach as long today. <laughs> Isn't that awful? <laughs> and then the Lord turned me into a preacher. There was always something exciting about the Lord's Supper Sundays, mainly because it was different. As a kid, you know, it was something that you walk in and it was, you knew something different was going to take place that day. I always knew that it was something special. I didn't always understand its full significance, but I knew it was something that the church set apart as special. First, the plate would be passed around. And listen, any time something that resembles a snack in church to a kid, that is always exciting. But I was sorely disappointed because it was just a little piece of bread and I'm thinking, I thought this was supposed to be a supper. Like this is, this is nothing. But then the cup came and the cup's the exciting part. I mean, it's hard to mess up juice for a kid. You could have juice in church. And I'd never seen a cup so small before. That was cool enough. And as the plate passed around, my sisters and I would always try to pick out the one with the most juice in it, like we had never had juice before. And there were many Sundays that this would just stress my mom out because I would go home with a red stain on my khakis from not being able to sit still as a child holding this little bitty cup of red juice. And then we'd take the elements as a church together. And I would try to get every last drop of that juice out of that cup, which meant oftentimes my cup would be tipped further and longer than anyone else in the church. And oftentimes my dad has felt like his arm must have stretched all the way across the end of the pew. He would touch the back of my head rather firmly, letting me know that was enough, son. And most of my memories as a child with the Lord's Supper clearly have nothing to do with the actual meaning of the Lord's Supper. And I wonder if maybe you shared that experience. Or maybe you grew up maybe in a, a Catholic experience where your, your memories and experience was completely different from mine in the Lord's Supper. Maybe for some of you, today is your first exposure to the Lord's Supper. I don't know. We certainly don't want to take for granted that, that there may be some who have never taken the Lord's Supper, and you may be wondering, well, what is this really all about? I suspect for most of you, you've done this countless times. 
So many times you've lost track of how many times you have taken the Lord's Supper. But maybe even now you don't fully understand why it is we practice this ritual as a church. I mean, when's the last time you paused to reflect on the meaning and the nature of the Lord's Supper? Why we do it, its significance, its seriousness. I mean, I, I have a lot of funny memories as a kid with the Lord's Supper, but in reality, this action is one of the, the most serious actions that a church participates in. I mean, throughout the church's history, this act of taking the Lord's Supper was one of the most serious actions of the church. I mean, during the Reformation in the 16th century and following, this issue of the Lord's Supper was right up there with justification by faith alone. In its seriousness and in its martyrdom. And Queen Mary, who became known as Bloody Mary in history, was named because she was known for brutally killing men and women who would hold a faithful stance on the Lord's Supper. She would lead them to be burned at the stake for what they believed about what we will do this morning. It's easy to perform such a ritual with routine and, and trivial demeanor. I mean, this is what we do as a church. This is routine and tradition. It's easy to be ho-hum about a tradition that you've always seen. But I'm devoting an entire message this morning on the Lord's Supper to emphatically state that this practice is not one that should be taken lightly or routinely. If you're visiting with us today, Normally, I preach expositionally, and what I mean by that is I'll take one passage of Scripture and I'll work through it, explaining its meaning and application for today. And currently, we're studying through the book of Philippians on Sunday mornings, verse by verse. And so, I would invite you back uh, next week as we continue that study. But today, this is a topical sermon on the what and why of the Lord's uh, Supper. Every now and then it's important to consider a particular subject and look over Scripture to see what Scripture says from various points in the Bible about that particular subject. And that's what we're doing for the Lord's Supper today. And I pray that it will prepare our hearts to take it in a few moments. My purpose in this sermon is very simple. I want to explain what the Lord's Supper is and its significance. All right, take, take a deep breath because today's sermon has eight points. And I know that's a lot. Preachers are supposed to preach shorter on communion Sundays. Well, I think you'll find most of the points to be rather brief. And plus, you'll know when I'm almost done. First, eight considerations for the Lord's Supper. First, in the Lord's Supper, we recognize that it is the Lord's Supper. Isn't it easy just to call it the Lord's Supper without pausing to reflect upon, wait a minute, this is the Lord's Supper. The language of it being the Lord's Supper comes from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, 20 where the Apostle Paul actually calls it that. And fundamentally, the Lord's Supper was established by Jesus Christ himself. And this is not a tradition that the, the church simply came up with over time. This might be a good idea for us to practice. No, this is a tradition that the church has performed over time because Jesus Christ told us to do so. And in our practice of this ordinance, we first recognize that it is an establishment by Jesus. He owns it. He directs it. He instituted it. He instructs it. We are to do this until he returns. This is one of two ordinances that Jesus put in place for the church. The Lord's Supper and the other is baptism. In baptism, we signify in a sign that we have been adopted by God through faith in Jesus Christ as one of his children. And therefore, we are publicly introduced to the church in our sign of baptism. That we are now in the family of God. Well, in the Lord's Supper, we celebrate being in the family of God by being brought to the family dinner table to, to, to participate as a family member around the table with our family. 
So in baptism, we're introduced in the family at the Lord's table. We're continually given a seat at the family dinner table. We are brought in close. And these are foremost actions of God. It is his salvation that he gives to us. And it is his supper that he invites us to. Second, in the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's accomplishment. We remember Christ's accomplishment. And look with me in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 14. This is the night that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this, and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the night Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. One of the core purposes of the Lord's Supper is for the church to remember what Christ has accomplished for us on our behalf. We learn one of the most well-known lines associated with the Lord's Supper in this. Do this in remembrance of me. But what are we remembering exactly? I mean, the Lord's Supper is a memorial. But what are exactly are we remembering? Specifically, we're remembering three things about Jesus' accomplishment on our behalf. First, we remember his body as a substitute. Look at verse 19. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. The bread we eat represents the, ver- the, the, represents the very body of Christ given for us. And I say we remember his body as a substitute because the text says, This is my body given for us. For you. For you. Given for you. And Jesus Christ did not deserve to go to the cross and die. The reason anyone was killed on the cross was because of some crime they committed, some sin, something wrong they had done. But the scripture tells us that Jesus never did anything wrong. Literally, he never sinned. And yet, his body was beaten. His body was whipped. And stabbed and spat upon. His body was stripped naked. His body was pierced with stakes. It was his body pressed against a splintering cross. It was his body rubbed raw. He was mocked and shamed and laughed at and harassed. His body was dehydrated. His body took the full anger and wrath for God. It was his body given for you. As we crush the bread in our mouth, we remember the body of Christ crushed for us. We remember his substitutionary body given in our place. And second, we remember his blood as a cleanser of sin. Look at verse 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The cup we drink represents the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Notice the picture of wine being poured out as imagery of the blood of Christ being poured out for the church. This is a gruesome event to remember as a church. I mean, in the Old Testament, a lamb would be led to be slaughtered for the sins of the people. It was, in the Old Testament, it was more of a covering than a complete cleansing. And so the animal sacrifice allowed God to pass over sins in divine forbearance, as Romans says, for many years. He would just pass over the sins because of these animal sacrifices. But the significance of Jesus dying is this. God would no longer pass over sins. He would no longer look at the sins and say, I'll deal with that later. The, sin, the, the significance of Jesus' death is that God would deal with sin finally. Once and for all. One final sacrifice would be made and it would come at the expense of God's own son. And like a lamb led to the slaughter, so too was Jesus led to the cross for his blood to be spilled violently. And this is the only occurrence I can think of where you see a gruesome spilling of a human being's blood as a good thing. When is that ever a good thing? Here it was. Hebrews 9, 22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. 1 John 1, 7. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. When we take the cup, we are fundamentally remembering that because Jesus died, we can live. Because his blood was shed, we are purified. Because his blood was spilled, ours could be preserved. We remember that Jesus' blood type is unique in that it doesn't stain like normal blood. Jesus' blood removes all stains. We remember his blood is a cleanser of sin. In the Lord's Supper, we see God highlight one of his attributes more than any other thing. In the Lord's Supper, we see God's grace highlighted maybe more than any other attribute of God. Because we remember his work on behalf of undeserving sinners. And church, isn't it so comforting to consider that out of all the attributes of God, God chose his grace to be ritually remembered in the church for all time. The attribute of his grace to be remembered. Yes, God is just. And yes, God is true. And yes, God has wrath. And yes, he is all of these things. But in the bread and in the cup, we remember that God is full of grace. If, if you're an unbeliever here this morning and you're kind of searching out who God is, let me tell you that God is full of grace. And this is how we remember him. J.C. Ryle said that God is more willing to forgive than man is ready to be forgiven. This is what we remember in his body and blood. In his accomplishment, his body is a sacrifice, a substitutionary body, as his blood, a cleanser of sin. And third, we remember his sovereign action in the new covenant. We remember his sovereign action in the new covenant. Now, I suspect that this may be new to many of you this morning, but this actually is maybe my favorite part of what we remember in the Lord's Supper. What does Jesus mean in chapter 22 of Luke, verse 20, when he says, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood? What is he talking about with the new covenant? I mean, the subject of the new covenant desire, deserves whole sermons alone. I'm just going to briefly introduce it to you this morning. 
What is, what's the deal with the new covenant language here? Well, first, consider the old covenant. In the Old Testament, God established his people in the old covenant, under the old covenant, when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. He gave them his law and the Ten Commandments and so on in the old covenant. And he said to them in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5. Listen what he says in Exodus 19, verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So, obey my voice, keep my covenant, and you will be a holy nation. And how do the people respond? Well, just a few verses later in Exodus 19 verse 8, listen how they respond. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. No, they won't. I mean, are you, are you kidding me? All of it, we will do, Lord. They didn't. Just read the Old Testament and you will see how sorely they dropped their end of the bargain. They didn't listen and they didn't obey. They didn't follow. So when Jesus says in chapter 20, verse 20, this is the blood of the new covenant, we might think, well, what good is that? Like, we as a people can't even keep the old covenant. We can't even keep our own end of the deal there. So why a new covenant? We didn't even keep the old one. Well, the new covenant Jesus is talking about here was actually prophesied as well about in the Old Testament. After years of disobedience from people breaking the covenant, we see God prophesy the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. Listen to what God says. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. Notice, no longer on tablets of stone. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'm not going to write the law on stones anymore. I'm going to write it on their hearts. And we may think, well, what if we turn from that as well? I mean, they didn't listen to the old covenant laws. Like, who's to say we're going to listen with it written on our hearts? Jeremiah 32, 40, he gives more of the new covenant. This is the Lord. He says, I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And listen to God's action here. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. <laughs> the new covenant is a game changer for the Bible. In the old covenant, the law is written on the stones. God says, listen to my voice, obey my commands, and you'll be a holy nation. In the new covenant, God doesn't leave it up to us. He takes his holy hand writing the law and he writes it on our hearts and he gives us a new heart that loves him, that follows in repentance and faith. That we, we, we don't you know, pull ourselves in our own strength and say, I'm going to follow the Lord. No, the sovereign Lord of the universe puts a new heart in us that desires to follow the Lord. In the new covenant, God sovereignly gives the people a new heart. One that wants to follow and obey him. And church, isn't it comforting that God supplies what he commands? He commands our allegiance and obedience and then he supplies us with a heart that is ready to follow. Follow. 
And on the cross, when the blood of Christ was spilled, the new covenant was inaugurated. Jesus said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is where it starts. In my dying, my resurrection, there's going to be a new people with new hearts. It is a work of God securing the people of God for all time. So in the Lord's Supper, we remember Christ's accomplishment, his body as a substitute, his blood as a cleanser of sin, and his sovereign work to build his global people. Third, in the, in the Lord's Supper, we participate in the body and blood of Christ. Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says this, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? In the Lord's Supper, we remember we participate in the body and blood of Christ. Paul says the bread and cup we share together is actually our participation in the body and blood of Christ. Now, we do not believe that these elements are turned into the body and blood of Christ. We believe this bread and this juice is just that, this bread and it is juice, and it represents the body and blood of Christ. However, there is still something massively important taking place here. Paul says that we participate in Christ's blood and his body in taking the Lord's Supper. And the word that he uses there, participate, the, it can, the root word is translated fellowship or communion, which is one, sometimes why we call the Lord's Supper communion. We are having a time of fellowshipping with Christ. We are communing with him in the Lord's Supper. And this word, participate, fellowship, is in the present active sense, which means that this fellowship, this participation with the Lord Jesus Christ is happening in the present reality. Like right now, when we take the Lord's Supper together, we will be presently, actively participating with Christ in his spiritual presence. He is here. And this means... The Lord's Supper is not simply a memorial service where we remember Christ, but more, we remember Christ, but it's a time where we especially fellowship with Christ. We participate in Him. It's a time where we submit our loyalty to Jesus once again. It's a time where we acknowledge our ultimate identity is in Christ. We look to Jesus in his presence and we say, Jesus, we are first Christians. Yes, we are teachers and accountants and electricians and plumbers and employees, but Jesus first, we are in you. You are our identity. And taking the Lord's Supper, we are uh, pledging our allegiance to him once more right before his presence. And shouldn't this church be a time of joy to sit around the table of our king, to fellowship at the table with the one who's given us a new heart, who has sacrificed his body and blood. This is a feast in the presence of Christ where we can have joyful relationship with him. But we're not just individuals participating with Christ, we are more, which is our fourth point. In the Lord's Supper, fourth, we demonstrate corporate unity with Christ. We demonstrate corporate unity with Christ. Look one verse later in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 17, says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. The church is made of individuals, but the individuals together make up the church. And growing up, I knew the Lord's Supper was something that 
we all participated in as the Lord's Supper as a church, but maybe it was just my personal experience, it felt more individualistic to me, like that we were a bunch of individuals in our cubicles at work on our lunch break. But Paul says twice in chapter 10, verse 17, in one verse, there is one bread at the beginning and at the end and sandwiched right in the middle of there is one bread. Yes, pun intended there. Right in the middle of saying twice there is one bread, he says we who are many are one body. The Lord's Supper is demonstrating our corporate unity with Christ. Christ did not just come to die for individuals. Christ died for his church. Which means God never intended for there to be individual Christians. Living life on their own. In the Lord's Supper we are pledging our loyalty to Christ. But we are also renewing our covenant with one another. Stating that we are in the body of Christ together. We need each other. Scripture does not have a category for the regular existence of a Christian not united to a local church. The Lord's Supper is not a picture of you and Jesus sitting at the end of a long fancy table Instead, the Lord's Supper is a picture where Jesus is the main figure and the table is surrounded by joyful family members. And this is why we take the Lord's Supper together, all together as a church, at the same time, which is what we'll do today. This is also why we take the Lord's Supper just in the corporate gathering of the church. Notice we're not taking the Lord's Supper in Sunday school or youth camp or small groups or any other place. The regular pattern in the New Testament for taking the Lord's Supper is reserved for the corporate gathering of the church. It is showing our corporate unity shared in Christ. Fifth, these last points will be the more quick points. Fifth, in the Lord's Supper, we proclaim Christ's death. Flip over one chapter in 1 Corinthians to chapter 11, verse 26. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, when you and I physically take the bread and we physically drink the cup, we're actually proclaiming something in that moment. We are proclaiming, I believe Jesus died and paid for my sins. And at the same time, you're proclaiming to everyone else watching, we believe Jesus died for a purpose. If you're an unbeliever in the room today, not yet fully trusting in Christ for your salvation. I realize that this, this all may be a little weird to you. And that's okay. I mean, Jesus lost tons of people when he was talking about this very subject. And eat my flesh and drink my blood. So it, it may be a little weird and I understand that's okay. But I need to proclaim to you today as a church will in a moment when we take the Lord's Supper... That Jesus died for a purpose. He died for sinners like you. He died to take the punishment from God for your sin. He died so that you could live. And one day you will have to stand before God and you will have to give an account for every word, every action in your life. And Jesus died so that you could stand in that moment and say, all the sin that filled my life was paid for at the cross. And that could be true for you today, for anyone today who's willing to turn from their sin and, and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. In taking the Lord's Supper, we proclaim that Christ's death was sufficient. There 
no longer remains a need for a sacrifice because Christ was the final one and it was sufficient. That our sin has been nailed to the cross, not in part of it, but the whole of it. So we remember, we proclaim Christ's death. Sixth, in the Lord's Supper, we partake the elements seriously. We partake the elements seriously. Look at chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to take the Lord's Supper seriously, not in an unworthy manner. It's a serious action to participate in the Lord's Supper. Listen, the Lord's Supper reminds us that it's a work that is supposed to remove all guilt. The body and blood of Christ given for sinners was in order to free the guilty. But Paul says if you take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, it doesn't free the guilty. Paul says you will become guilty for the body and blood of Christ. And just consider the seriousness of that charge. Imagine standing before a jury and them saying, well, what is he guilty of? I'm guilty of having the body and blood of the Son of God on my hands. Look in the next verses, verses 29 through 30. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body first, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died, Paul says. When we take the Lord's Supper in a flippant or trivial manner, unworthy manner, the Bible says it doesn't serve to nourish our souls and body, but instead it inflicts judgment from the Lord upon ourselves. Look, medicine is a wonderful thing, but if you take medicine in an unworthy manner, it will kill you. And notice that These are real physical judgments. The text says that this is why some of them were weak and ill and some have died. Like people died as a result of taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy way. The Lord's Supper is meant to nourish, but if we take it in an unworthy manner, it is a deadly practice. Literally for these people here. It's a serious act of worship to participate in. I mentioned earlier that it should be a joyful celebration around the table with our king. But don't equate joyfulness with flippancy or lightheartedness. This should be a solemn act of worship. And because it's so serious in nature, seventh, in the Lord's Supper, We examine ourselves wholly or completely. We examine ourselves wholly. Look at verse 29 of chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. For anyone who eats of the bread and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. In other words, before taking the Lord's Supper, there should be a moment of reflection where we have a time to examine our hearts before the Lord. To say, Lord, if there is anything that I need to repent of before taking this, please bring it to light. If there are any hidden sins that are in the dark, please bring them to the light. If there is a brother or sister that I have sinned against that I need to go to them and say, please forgive me. We should do these things before taking the Lord's Supper to examine ourselves. And that's why in a moment, when right before we take the Lord's Supper, I'm going to give you a, a, a time to just sit and reflect, to pray to the Lord in private prayer, to think on these things. And if the Lord reveals something to you in need of asking for forgiveness, ask the Lord to forgive you, and He will. Absolutely will. And then take the Lord's Supper after examining your heart. So we partake the elements seriously and we examine ourselves wholly. Final point, eighth, in the Lord's Supper, we reserve its practice for believers in good standing with a faithful gospel church. 
In the Lord's Supper, we reserve its practice for believers in good standing with a faithful gospel church. In light of all we've covered today, in light of all that Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has said about the Lord's Supper, it only makes sense that believers would be the ones to participate in the Lord's Supper. Only believers. If you're an unbeliever here today, I, I want to let you know that we are glad that you are here at this gathering of Abner Creek Baptist Church. We want you to be here every Sunday. But if you're here and you're an unbeliever, we would invite you as the plate is passed in just a moment to let the plate pass by without taking. It's better that than to drink judgment upon yourself. The call for you as an unbeliever today is to repent and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you do that today for the first time, I would love to hear about it. In fact, I'll be at the back at the end of the service. If you would let me know that today I've trusted in Christ, I want to help you as you seek to follow Christ faithfully. I want to walk with you in that effort. So this is a practice reserved for believers in good standing with a faithful gospel church. Remember, this is not an individualistic event, which is why I say in good standing with a faithful gospel church. If you're a visitor with us here today, or if you're a regular attender, you're not a member. If, if, if you're here today, if you're in good standing with a faithful gospel church and you're a believer, we would invite you to participate with us as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, just one, one note of truth that I think it's helpful to point out. Parents, if, if your child isn't a believer or yet doesn't fully understand the things of the Lord's Supper, I would ask and suggest from the, from the Scripture that you keep your child from participating today. You say, oh. And it's actually a loving thing to do to help your child think through the importance of these things before they participate in such a serious act of worship. What a wonderful opportunity for a discussion about the gospel with them on the way home. The Lord's Supper is reserved for believers in good standing with a faithful gospel church. It's here in remembering these things, these eight things about the Lord's Supper that we find most comfort. For some of you believers today, you need the reminder of this desperately. I mean, maybe you look at the Lord's Supper, you come in this morning, you see the Lord's Supper sitting here, and you just feel guilty. Guilty about a decision you made last night, guilty about a decision you made this past week, I mean, the last thing that you feel worthy to do in this time is to take the Lord's Supper in a, a holy act of worship. For many of you, you just feel guilty. And such shame that you feel is real and may be deserved. So let's, let's be honest about the struggles that often are in the church. Just because we're not yet fully glorified in the Lord. Perhaps you're a believer here today and you've come and you feel shame and regret and guilt. The pornography that you just looked at this week or last night has just torn your body down and you just feel so dirty this morning. Perhaps that slight comment made toward your spouse this morning feels pretty awful right now before we take the Lord's Supper and you're the impatience shown toward a child. You feel the weight of your impatience toward a child and you know the patience that the Lord has had with you. The lack of prayer time or time with God makes you feel quite hypocritical today. The anger that you express with your family members or that coworker or on the way to church this morning with the person in front of you or the, the drunkenness that you participated in over the weekend. The last thing you feel like doing is taking a part in a holy act like the Lord's Supper. And I'll just offer this to you this morning. Whatever it is, believer, that has you feeling shameful and guilty, 
this morning causing you to think that you are unworthy to take the Lord's Supper, whatever it is, I would offer this reminder to you. We are unworthy. And that's why Christ gave his body for you. We are sinners. And that's why Christ shed his blood for you. This is not a meal for righteous people. This is a meal for sinners who have found salvation in God, in Christ, and have been radically transformed by his grace. The Lord's Supper is a place of refuge for the tired believer, not a place of shame and guilt. This is a meal that reminds us that the shame that you feel over sin is the shame that Jesus took upon himself. And the guilt that you feel for that transgression is the guilt and regret that Jesus took upon himself. So whatever it is that you think as a believer keeps you from this moment, it is through the Lord's Supper that Jesus reminds you that he says, I have taken that shame and I have taken that guilt and I have taken that regret and I have paid for that sin. And so no matter how dirty and shameful you feel, Jesus wants you to remember his work for you on your behalf. This is a meal that reminds us no matter how dirty we are, as we are, Jesus gave his body for our filth. And so God wants his people to certainly repent of sin, examine our hearts, and then he wants us to take the bread and cup to remember his continual grace given to us. The grace that will keep us in fellowship with him and one another for all eternity. Believer, if you feel unworthy this morning, guilty, this meal is for you. Not to shame you, but to remind you of God's sufficient grace for you. Let's pray. Oh God, you are so good to us that you would give your son not for good people, that you would give your son for your enemies, for people who have hearts in rebellion against you. Thank you, Lord, for your reminders in Scripture that the body and blood of Christ have, has been given for the church. And Lord, I pray that as we take the Lord's Supper together now that you would be glorified and that we would be edified in this act of worship. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have that time of examination now and I'm going to invite Jason and the deacons to go ahead and come forward. This is going to be a time of quiet reflection where you sit in private prayer asking the Lord to examine your hearts. There's not going to be any music. There's not going to be any talking or any public prayer. This is going to be a complete silent time where we examine our hearts before the Lord. And then at the end of that time, I'll bring us together to participate in the Lord's Supper. So right now where you are, examine your heart before the Lord. Prepare your heart to take the Lord's Supper together.